Okay. Getting to tonight's study, then. We are in the book of Leviticus. We're in the seventh session of what will probably turn out to be 16. So we're almost halfway. And uh, we're in chapters 11 and 12. And uh, let me uh, give you some terrific, rather probably surprising medical advice. Are you ready for this? Stand by. To prevent the hair from turning gray. Have any of you wondered about that? Well, I found a recipe for this. that to, To prevent the hair from turning gray, you anoint it with the blood of a black calf, which has been boiled in oil or with the fat of a rattlesnake. Did you know that? Isn't that remarkable? Let me give you, you worried about losing hair? Here's another one. When it falls out, one remedy is to apply a mixture of six fats, namely those of the horse, the hippopotamus, the crocodile, the cat, the snake, and the ibex. And to strengthen it, anoint it with the tooth of a donkey crushed in honey. Any of you tried that before? <laughs> Don't knock it if you have it. Oh, you did. I got happy. <laughs> You try anything. All right. Well, this is the time to try. There was a special version of this for the Egyptian queen Shishak that consisted of equal parts of a heel of an Abyssinian greyhound, date blossoms, and ass's hooves boiled in oil. And this was, this was supposed to make the royal hair grow. And as you can probably guess, I'm quoting this from a papyrus, Ebers. It's a very famous document. Papyrus Ebers was uh, uh, pulled together about 1552 B.C., this is obviously a very ancient document. Um, give you some other ex- excerpts from it. Embedded splinters. Any guys get splinters? Well, what they did in those days, apparently, they treated it with worm's blood and ass's dung. Now, you can, if you don't know anything about that, you can imagine uh, that uh, since the, the dung has uh, tetanus spores, that they probably had a lot of lockjaw in, in Egypt. Um, a properly outfitted medicine cabinet apparently it should include a lizard's blood, swine's teeth, putrid meat, stinking fat, moisture from pig's ears, milk goose grease, ass's hooves, animal fats from various sources, excreta, which is, you know what I'm talking about, I didn't pronounce it right, but you know, uh, there's alternative words I'll defer to, not uh, decline to use, uh, from animals including human beings, donkeys, antelopes, dogs, cats, and even flies. Try finding some of that. <laughs> anyway, uh, now, I said, Chuck, what are you doing? I think this document is profoundly significant because of Acts 7.22. See, at the time that this treatise embodied the current beliefs of that culture, Moses was born. And Acts 7.22 tells us that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So Moses grew up at court, trained by the best, in, among other things, this medical perspective. You say, well, that's pretty wild. Yes, you know, any, you can always look back on any culture and sort of smile at their beliefs, but in any case, this was their beliefs. And what, here's what the astonishing thing is, is that when he led the nation Israel, out from Egypt into the wilderness and was given the Torah, one of which, of course, is the book of Leviticus that we're dealing with, not one of these bizarre presumptions crept into the work. Now, the theorists will say, well, that's an argument from silence. Yes, but I think it's an incredibly persuasive one. If you understand human nature, if you understand the culture there, Egypt was the rule of the world. They were considered the you know, the Santa Quinon, the, 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 the premier culture on the planet Earth at the time. And he was at court, Pharaoh's court. And yet none of these things, even color or tailor or in any way shade, the results of what we call the Torah, the five books of Moses. Now, it goes even further. When he led them into the wilderness, God gave them God gave him a very special promise in Exodus 15, verse 26. He said, God said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give an ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee. 
which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So he not only was exposed to all that nonsense, God promised that as long as they're obedient, he would deliver them from all the obvious confusion that many of the diseases they had were brought upon themselves by all these, you know, strange practices. And uh, now what's fascinating, what we're going to encounter here a little bit in tonight's study, is the instructions in the Torah, specifically Leviticus uh, 11 and 12 here, uh, anticipate modern medical discoveries. For example, the avoidance of cancer among Jewish women. They now know is it largely measured because of the because of the presence of circumcision. There's a whole analysis of that. Uh, the isolation of contagious diseases. When the bubonic plague went through Europe, taking one out of four, 25 percent of people died in Europe. The Jews were noticeably, not entirely, but noticeably um, immune uh, to a lot of these things because they because of some of their hygienic practices. That even gave rise to some strange uh, uh, myths about the Jews. Uh, you know, talk about that as we get there. But uh, the the church, the medieval church, starting to draw upon the Jewish practices out of Leviticus, began to turn it by isolating those that are ill by, by taking people who are contagious and isolating them. Very, to us, seems obvious. Not to them, not in those days. It's exactly the hygiene that the Leviticus talks about. So many of these discoveries that have been made, were made 4,000 years later, you'll find tucked away in this book. We'll look at a few of them. And uh, now we're going to, in this section, you can also tell we're going to switch radically. The book of Leviticus in this chapter, uh, in uh, chapter 11, switches. We've been talking about the priests. Now we're going to talk about the people. It's a change of subject. We've been talking about the offerings to God, and now we're going to talk about the food, the diet for man, Mr. and Mrs. Man. And we're going to switch from the worship of God to our walk in the world. We're in a major change of, 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 of shifting of gears, if you will, of this in this book. Another comment before we jump in. We today, I think, make a mistake about the difference between sacred and sacred. On the one hand, we don't treat things sacredly. The word sacred tends to be sort of foreign in our vocabulary, on the one hand. On the other hand, we also tend to relegate the to sacred things, those things of the church or something, and we live in the secular world. Well, the truth matter that you can make the case that there's nothing secular before the throne of God. Everything in our lives, including what we eat for breakfast, can be done to the glory of God. Now, could the God of this universe concern himself with what his creatures have for dinner? Apparently. Apparently, we'll take a look. You know, it's interesting. Whenever we purchase some complex piece of equipment, it might be a car or a computer or whatever, one of the things we always do is consult, or should do, is consult the instructions that were provided by the manufacturer. You know, I suppose they should have when all else fails, we check the instructions, right? But um, it's interesting that uh, the manufacturer can best advise us regarding the care and feeding of a product. When we buy something very new that we in an area we haven't ever had before, you have to check it out in terms of how you take care of it and uh, so forth. And uh, Now, it's interesting. Our designer has given us guidelines for our care and feeding, too. In fact, he's done one. Also, if you, what many people do, if you've bought, if you recently you bought a very technical product and you have some questions, you get on the Internet. They all have a website, and that will respond to the, you know, the most frequently asked questions and so forth. What's interesting, our designer has a 24-hour hotline that's open, and you don't have to have an Internet subscription to, to access it. It's interesting, though, as, a, a, as we study, I've been, because I'm in anticipation of the coming lesson, uh, uh, we've been studying about the plagues a little bit of the, that were desolating Europe, and uh, the, uh, the Jews so universally escaped um, infection that uh, their very exception, apparent ex- exception of these things excited a popular suspicion, and they were accused of causing the fearful mortality among Gentile neighbors by poisoning wells and springs. Many of these weird myths, anti-Semitic myths, some of them can be traced back to the plague because they were apparently favored and resented by the Gentile neighbors because of that. And when much of what was they were missing as a result of their peculiar, very restrictive form of hygiene. 
But uh, anyway, let's just jump in. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses. There's that phrase again. This is a direct, this chapter is a direct quote from God to Moses. The Lord spake unto Moses and, and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel. Notice now this is to the congregation it brought. It isn't just the Aaron and the priest. This is broader. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among the beasts that are on the earth. And he's going to go on and talk about this. You know, we need to remember that God um, draws a strict line of demarcation between light and darkness, between right and wrong, between clean and unclean. And uh, he's the guy that made the place. He makes the rules. What is right and what is wrong? Ask God. It's not relative. It's absolute. God has made it very, very clear. He's very precise, very specific. We may not like what we see, but there they are, black and white. He lays it out. Now, these beasts, by the way, this idea of clean and unclean that he's going to get into, uh, are not unique to Moses. turns out that uh, Noah recognized these divisions. And we have reason to suspect that these divisions were instituted not just in, by Moses, not in even just Noah, but even probably in Eden. These probably go far back, back further than, uh, than ever. I personally suspect strongly that they were, uh, they date back to Eden. He may be more elaborated on, more, you know, made more fundamentally uh, defined in the Mosaic law, but they're, in a sense, they're not a new, new subject. Now let's, as we get into this, let's you and I recall before we get all concerned about whether you could have a shrimp cocktail or not. <laughs> We have no command, we as Gentiles have no command concerning clean and unclean animals for food. In fact, uh, what's our authority for that? Not just an argument from silence, Acts chapter 10, where uh, Peter gets this vision of the the sheet lowered down full of all these weird things and uh, that were unclean. And he wasn't going to touch it. And God says, don't, God tells him, don't you call unclean what God has now called clean. So that distinction served its purpose, apparently, in the Old Testament period. But even in, even in the New Testament period, way back then even, uh, these things were, were apparently uh, modified, at least for the, for the non-Jew. But now, for Israel, getting back to the context of the Torah here, for Israel, the distinction between clean and unclean had many purposes, not the least of which was to make them distinctive from the Gentile nations. If they have other merits, but if they didn't have any merit at all, one could justify it. That's God's way of making them separate, which is what He's called them to be, separate. Are you with me? So it's part of God's program for Israel. Let's move on, verse 3. Whosoever parteth the hoof and is cloven footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. That may sound kind of weird. What's that got to do with anything? Well, this rule, incidentally, is repeated in Deuteronomy chapters 14 to 6, where it actually lists a bunch of animals. Here we're going to get the principle. There we'll get some of the detail. But the point is, is the distinction between clean and unclean does not follow any normal biological division. But the health factor is involved. There's been a lot of study through the centuries on why are the, you know, what makes these different. It turns out that most of the scholars have come, come to quite a, agreement. The animals that were forbidden were largely unclean feeders. They ate things that were unclean, that were dirty, that were that were that carried parasites, uh, and they're much more liable to disease. Um, S. H. Kellogg, in his commentary, points out one of the greatest discoveries of modern science is the fact that a large number of diseases to which animals are liable are due to the presence of low forms of parasitic life. And to such diseases, um, those which are unclean in their feeding will be especially exposed, while none will perhaps be found wholly exempt. Another discovery of recent times was that no less important bearing on the question raised by this chapter is the now ascertained fact that many of these parasitic diseases are common to both animals and men and may be communicated from the former to the latter. So the point is, it's in studying what you discover as you study these lists is what they have in common, the unclean animals have in common, is that they are filthy eaters. Um, if they, in fact, we'll see here, uh, the whole idea of chewing the cud, the part the hoof and chewing the cud. Um, those that chew cud are vegetarians. There are no carnivores in the list, because carnivores would be open to all kinds of, of diseased eating. 
because they'll feed on, on carcasses of other animals and things, and who knows? So feeding on a carnivore's animal increases your liability. Now, in today's society, you can argue that some of those things, because of a lot of other reasons, aren't operative, fine, but the point is they were then, so it's interesting. Verse 4, Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is, an, he is unclean to you. By the way, it's interesting, you can also spiritualize this a little bit, that to meditate is a figurative expression that comes from a cow chewing the cud. See, we are to meditate on his word. There's, a, there's some, some, some of the scholars, I'm, I, I don't spend, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that approach, but you can look at a lot of these things and sort of allegorize or spiritualize them if you like. The parting of the hoof speaks of the walk, as, uh, that, of the believer being walking in separation. One of the things that uh, you might just keep in mind that every time a Jew saw any of these animals, he would be reminded, in fact, he'd make a decision, in effect, of being separate. The fact that other people might eat him makes him different. Do you follow me? What well, goes on, verse 5, And the coney, because he cheweth the cud and divideth not the hoof, he is unclean uh, unto you. Now, whether the coney really chews it or not, he appears to. There's a, there's a whole big, there's a whole thing about rabbits and stuff, and I won't get into that here. Uh, they don't really chew the cud, but they look like they do. The point is, the distinctives to teach them, that's why they're keeping, he's, 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 he's declared unclean. Verse 6, And the hare, because he cheweth the cud and divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to, unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and he be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. He's eating all the time, but he's not chewing the cud. He's not a vegetarian. You know, okay. Verse Of the flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. Oh, boy. They are unclean to you. Now, um, Again, if you can go through the list, and there's lists in Deuteronomy equivalent here that basically they're the ones that are excluded are carnivorous animals and uh, only vegetable eating animals to the cut. Now the next group of verses go into the fish. These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers... Of all that move in the waters, of any thing, living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination to you. Boy, there goes the shrimp cocktails. There also goes shark meat, I guess, because they don't have scales, I guess, do they? They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but you shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins or scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. Now again, in the fish case, they've got very clear definitions. They either have fins and scales, or they don't. And if they have fins and scales, okay. It's interesting how that seems to be a safe division. Crawling creatures in the water were forbidden. So those of you that uh, enjoy lobster and crab, I guess you have to uh, just flee to Acts 10 and say, okay, those rules don't apply to us. But I'll say candidly, there are many Christians that try, and I mean not strictly, not in, a, not in a legalistic sense, but tend to avoid those things that were prohibited to Israel. You know, on sort of the presumption that someday we may discover that despite modern hygiene and modern food processing, they may not as be as harmless as most people presume. So who knows? I have no strong opinions about that. I just share with you the Word of, but the word, the word of God here, those focusing on Israel, is very specific. Verse 13, and these are they which shall live in the, uh, in, in the abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination. Now the fowls they list have different names. There's a lot of scholastic debate on exactly which bird is meant by which Hebrew term. So don't, uh, don't get hung up on this, but uh, the, the trouble with the fowls are that the, div the divisions are not quite as crisp as they are with fish. Um, because they all have feathers, etc. <laughs> they didn't help you with the scales and, 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 uh, and so on, and the fins. But anyway, uh, it says they, uh, these are the, they which shall not, shall, that she shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the ossifrage, and the osprey, and the vulture, and the kite after his kind, and every raven after his kind. Now the ossifrage, by the way, is a, a sea eagle in the minds of some of the scholars. The osprey is a fish hawk. Both of these then, uh, Prey, as many, especially the seaborne uh, or the aquatically oriented ones, typically prey on other. They're, they're uh, carnivorous. I mean, they, they go after. Uh, they're not. They're not vegetarians at this point. 
and they go after uh, carcasses or various living prey. And the vulture and the kite, the kite, uh, they're as familiar to them as to, to us the uh, eagle and the raven are. These are the birds of the air. Then it talks about the birds, of the, what they call the birds of the earth, the owl, the night hawk, and the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind. Now, the owl is actually the ostrich, uh, by, in the minds of most scholars. The word translated night hawk here is a species of owl known in Syria, very ravenous and known to attack infants. These are vicious. They, they sound colorful, but they're vicious. The little owl and the cormorant and the great owl. The great owl is the bittern in the minds of these. And the swan, or more, more precisely, the purple bird. Porphyrio hyacinthinus. I guess I'm not a bird lover. Or I'm not an ornithologist, so I'm probably mucking this all up here. But anyway, the swan, the pelican, and the gyre eagle, which is the gyre eagle can be extremely aggressive, apparently, seizing fish or winged fowl. So all of these, as you say, are unclean eaters. And the stork. See, the stork feeds on lizards, frogs, serpents, and other living things. And you have no idea whether they're diseased or not or carrying parasites that would be injurious to humans. That's the problem. The heron after their, her kind and the lapwing and the bat. The heron can also be angry and irritable as it goes after its prey. The lapwing has beautiful feathers, but it's filthy in its eating habits. And on the birds, there are no visible markers, but the unclean birds were the ones that were unclean feeders. They fed on duck, dead carcasses of animals, fish, and other fowl. The specific list, by the way, has been studied, and it reveals that the mosaic system as described here, was intended for the nation Israel and their particular geography. It, lets, it focuses on those species that were indigenous to the land of Canaan uh, in that area. Now, the lesson for us today, I don't think we have to get concerned about that in the usual sense. In fact, uh, today's legislation tends to protect some of these species as endangered species now, so it's quite different. And uh, the uh, guy was on trial you probably read about it. A guy was on trial for having uh, been caught camping, and he was eating, uh, I think it was a condor, and they put him on trial. And uh, and uh, at the trial, he gave the judge a real hard luck story about how he was desperately hungry. He was trying to survive, and that's all that was available. And he ate it and so forth. And the judge had mercy on him and, you know, waived his sentence. He was guilty, but he, he, he waived his sentence. And so it happened as he was leaving the courthouse, the judge went up to him and said, you know, I, I can't help but off the record just ask you, what did the condor taste like? He says, oh, pretty much like a bald eagle, a little saltier. <laughs> anyway, silly story. I'm just, I was just kidding, by the way, if any of you are bird lovers. I was just, that's just a silly story. All right. By the way, speaking of raven, you know, remember, Elijah was fed by the ravens. He didn't eat the ravens. The ravens brought him food, but that's interesting uh, for what it's worth. Anyway, next we get into the creeping uh, creatures. Verse 20, all fowls that creep, going on all four, shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap withal upon the earth. And I have, no, you know, uh, you may wonder, what on earth? Those kangaroos? No, bear in mind, these are, these are insects, okay? All insects are unclean except for four locusts that he's going to describe here. Even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, the bald locust after his kind, the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after this kind. These are translations from the Hebrew, but apparently what they're referring to is four different kinds of locusts. And they're okay. They're the only insects that are. You may recall John the Baptist had his diet was of locusts and wild honey. Now, if you're called to the ministry, that doesn't mean you have to follow John the Baptist diet, by the way. I, I, uh, I'll pass on any of those ideas. In fact, it goes on here, verse 23, But all other flying, creeping things which have four feet which shall be an abomination unto you. So in other words, with the exception of those, those first four, all the insects are unclean. But now we get into a whole other group. Contact with carcasses. Verse 24, And for these shall ye be unclean. Whosoever toucheth a carcass of them shall be unclean until evening. If your robe brushed on one, walking by, you're unclean. Whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. The carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof, and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cud, be unclean to you. Every one that toucheth them shall be unclean. 
The carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof and, and is not cloven-footed nor cheweth the cud are unclean to you. Every one that touches them shall be unclean. And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean to you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean till evening. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes, be unclean until evening. They are unclean unto you. Now there's a very important principle that's going to be laid on us here. Cleanness or holiness is not transferred by contact. Uncleanness or unholiness is. Very basic principle here. It's impossible to bring holiness out of the unholy. But the unclean can contaminate the clean. It's a one-way street, so to speak. An unrighteous man cannot produce righteous works, is the broad application of that. You cannot bring righteousness out of unrighteousness. A boy with measles never was never cured by contact with a boy who was well. Another example, perhaps. Here's another example that maybe pinch a little more. A Christian cannot mingle with the world and play with sin without being contaminated. Verse 29, These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth, the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind and the ferret, and the chameleon, and the lizard, and the snail, and the mole. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whosoever doth touch them when they be dead shall be unclean until the evening. These are creatures that live on the ground or even under the ground. And upon whatsoever any of them when they are dead doth fall, it shall be unclean. Whether it be any vessel of wood, or raiment, or skin, or sack, Whatsoever vessel it be wherein any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until evening, so it shall be cleansed. And every earthen vessel whereunto any of them uh, falleth, whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and ye shall break it. Of all meat which shall be eaten, that on which such water cometh shall be unclean. And all drink that may be drunk in every such vessel shall be unclean. And everything whereupon any part of their carcass falleth shall be unclean, whether it be oven or ranges for pots, or shall be broken down. And they are unclean, and they shall be unclean to you. Nevertheless, a fountain or pit, wherein there is plenty of water, it shall be clean. But that which toucheth their carcass shall be unclean. You know, this is astonishing rhetoric that was 4,000 years before the study of bacteria. You know, you and I take these kinds of things for granted because most of us, uh, in one way or another, have had exposure to modern hygiene. But stop and think of this. And when you contrast this with the belief structure of the nations of that time, it's really breathtaking. It's really astonishing. God taught His people that cleanliness is ne- next to godliness. And that's a, that's a, there, there are ceremonial is, issues here. I'll come back to that in a minute. But there's just basic hygiene here that is uh, uh, astonishing. It's just, well, put it the other way around. It's astonishing that 4,000 years could go by, and it took rel- it's relatively modern days for people to discover the role of bacteria and germs and viruses and all that sort of stuff that you and I take for granted. Now, it's interesting. Verse 36 talks about what we call living water, flowing water. A fountain or pit wherein there's plenty of water shall be clean. That's interesting. Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ is also a fountain of living water, as, as, as is emphasized in John chapter 4 and John chapter 7. But uh, he uses that idiom of himself, in, in obviously in a spiritual sense. Verse 37, If any part of their carcass fall upon any sowing seed, which is to be sown, it shall be clean. We've moved from the kitchen now out into the field. Dry seed that was supposed to be sown was not to be uh, contaminated. If it got wet, it was contaminated. It's for some good reasons. Verse 30. But if any water be put upon the seed and any part of the carcass fall thereon, it shall be unclean to you. Now we're going to get into another group where it's contact with carcasses of clean animals. That's a different case. Verse 39. If any beast of which ye may eat die, in other words, these are ones you can eat. They're okay. If he should die, he that touches the carcass thereof shall be unclean until evening. And he that eateth of the carcass of it shall wash his clothes, be clean until even. And also he that beareth the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be clean until evening. And every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. 
Whatsoever goeth upon the belly, and whatsoever goeth upon all four, and whatsoever hath more feet among all creeping things that creep upon the earth, them shall ye not eat, for they are an abomination. Ye shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall ye make yourselves unclean with them, that ye should be defiled thereby. So everything that crept on the earth went on its belly, was unclean. Now, there's probably good hygiene reasons for that. There's probably another reason. What is that reminiscent of? The fall of man in Genesis 3. The curse on Satan. On the belly thou shalt go, and so forth. You see, one of the things, one of the implications of all of this is, every time that a Jew, what I'll call an observant Jew, an orthodox Jew, one that's serious about his faith, every time he sees a weasel, or a rabbit, or any animal, he sees it in terms of God's restrictions. Every time he saw one of these things, there's a decision implied to go with God or to ignore, to either accept or ignore God's demands. He was constantly confronted with the fact that he was called to be separate. He was called to a different standard. He was called to... So quite apart from the health or hygienic aspects of these, there's another aspect that's probably every bit as important. And that is that he was consistently and very conscious of, um, of the fact that he was in a special role with God. Verse 44, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy. For I am holy. See, this is not, this is not hygiene now. He's talking about just obeying God's rules. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Interesting. All creeping things were representative of the fall of man. The serpent was cursed, made to crawl in his belly, and that's maybe part of the imagery here. Verse 46. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl of every living creature that moveth in the waters and every creature that creepeth upon the earth. To make a difference between the unclean and the clean, between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. One of the things we should be inferring by the time we've gotten through 11 chapters of, of uh, the book of Leviticus is that holiness is, uh, in little things, is essential. Holiness is not an approximate game. Holiness is a purity issue. In the semiconductor world, where we try to make many, many chips in a single wafer to be processed through the plant, um, they speak of defect density. Uh, you want the defect density as low as possible so that the yield, the good, the good chips on that thing are as, 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 as many as possible. And you have a whole warfare, if you will, going, trying to get against uh, defects from dust or whatever. Special clean rooms, special chemicals, all that stuff. But they speak of def defect density. And, uh, the game with God is the defect density has to be zero. No rejects, you see. The acid test of any life, of any God's people is this. I am your Lord, I am holy, be ye holy. Now every one of us here, we're not under the law, and we're not subject to the dietary laws of, of the Old Testament on the one hand, but we do have to make a decision whether we're going to walk with God and for God while we are in this contaminated world. There are a thousand places that are probably far more subtle than deciding whether to have a shrimp cocktail or not, <laughs> in which we have to decide. Every day, are we walking with God or are we compromising? Does God wink at any of these details? No, I think God is serious about what he's dealing with here. And that's, I think, the lesson of this chapter on clean and unclean. To make distinctions, most of the things we deal with, we know what God's preferences are. But now we get to, right after chapter 11 comes chapter 12. <laughs> Change the subject. I'm going to call this the transmission of original sin. You know, our great physician, as we call Jesus sometimes, is a specialist in all the fields. Previous chapter, we talked about dietetics and pediatrics, perhaps. Uh, this chapter is going to deal with obstetrics. The previous chapter, you could have sin by contact. It was dealing with the external character of sin. The external, by contacting a dead body or something, touching it. This chapter 
is going to focus on the internal nature of sin. Because sin is a genetic defect that we all inherit. And that's what it's going to focus on. Remember what David said in Psalm 51. That, you know, he, had, he sinned with Bathsheba, but he repented of it. He went before the Lord and he poured out his soul in what we call Psalm 51. But right then, about the fifth verse of that, he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David was a sinner from the time he was born. And that's the... See, this do, there's a doctrine that's probably most widely ignored or disputed, and yet is observable every day in the paper. And that's the total depravity of man. That man is good for nothing. I know most of you girls have already discovered that. I understand that. But uh, we see this demonstrate, even though it's a controversial doctrine among some theologians, it is, we see it every day. Man is a sinner. Uh, those that are parents, see this right away, your child. Leave him alone. What is he going to do? Is he going to lie, steal, cheat, rebel, whatever? It takes training and, and discipline to get him or her in some approximation of appropriate conduct. This is all Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You know, it's interesting, whenever there's a baby, someone has a, a baby, everybody loves the baby, this cuddly, sweet little baby. We love to admire, and that's fine, don't misunderstand me. But God would also have us realize that that baby is a sinner. He was born in sin. He was brought into the world by a mother and father who are sinners. What else could it be? And that's part of what's going to be uh, uh, emerge here in the discussions in uh, Leviticus 12. But that raises a question right away, and let me anticipate some of the questions I would get at the end of this session. <laughs> Is a baby who dies as an infant lost? It's a sinner. In sin did my mother conceive me, David says. That baby is born. It's very sweet and cuddly. We admire it for all the obvious human reasons. And yet it's a sinner. That baby, that child is a sinner. Is it lost? How many think it's lost? Can I see a show of hands? How many think it's, it's saved? Can I see a show of hands? Oh, you big sentimentalists, you. <laughs> Prove it. Everybody's wincing. Well, I do believe that the baby is saved. In Adam, all die. And that's the reason the little baby died that we're talking about, this hypothetical baby that died. But we do believe that all those that die prior to the age of accountability are saved. Now, we say that because it's emotionally it's more comfortable to us all, but that's not a valid ground. In 2 Samuel 12... David's child, the first son of Bathsheba, is gravely ill. And David is fasting and praying and very upset because the child is near death. And uh, one day the servants are afraid to go to David because the child has died and they're afraid to tell him. They're sort of murmuring. And he senses that there's something up. And, and they, they tell him that, yes, the child is, they have to admit it, yes, the child is dead. Thinking that David's going to come unglued. Because he had went through all this. He stops praying, cleans up, goes back to work. And they're surprised. In fact, they, you know, try to understand. He says, while the child was ill, perhaps by praying so that God might heal him. But if he's dead, that's fine. But he makes a remark in Second Samuel twelve twenty three. He says, I will go to him. Meaning what he's saying, he knows that when he dies, he's going to be there with David when David dies. So David clearly, you know, substantiates that. There is a more technical term, or basis, if you will, in Romans 7. Romans chapter 7 is Paul's, some people call it law school. Paul is uh, deeply into uh, the whole role of the law. And uh, you might turn with me to Romans 7, because this is a little technical but it's something that you may really want to have command of because this will come up. Uh, we're heading for ver verse 9. But let's pick it up, but start about verse 7. Uh, he's made a big, he's made six verses here of case that the, that, uh, uh, 
about the law. In verse 7 he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had, this is very, yeah, verse 7. For I had not known coveting except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now that's an analogous. If you're on a corner house and you've got a lawn, just put a sign on there, keep off the grass, and watch the trail that will form across your lawn, you know. A hotel that was right on the waterfront with the balconies had a sign, don't fish from the balcony. And everybody did. They took down the signs, they didn't have a problem. It never occurred to them. You know, they go out there and enjoy the view. You know, there's, there's a perverseness in man, you know. These are probably poor examples, but that's sort of the flavor of what he's saying. I would not have known coveting except the Lord said, Thou shalt not Verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of coveting, for apart from the law, sin is dead, or at least not yet manifest. But then verse 9 has a strange phrase. Paul says, For I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Well, I'm not going to try to make a whole exposition of Romans 7, but the key point behind this is, you have to add, when you get to verse 9, when could Paul have been alive, spiritually alive, apart from the law? Then the commandment came and he died. When could that have been? Only one time. That was before he was at the age of accountability. See, I was alive apart from the law once, but when the, sin, when the commandment came, when I understood it, see, I'm accountable. And that's the... That's the Sounds like a very technical argument, but it's the only way that the thing really resolves. And so that's the, the, the couple of examples I've given you are the reasons that I think most conservative theologians would argue that a child before the age of accountability is saved. Now, there's some that confine that to just save parents, but there's no basis for that that, I know, that I'm aware of that's justifiable. If it fits, it fits. There are different views, and that's fine, but for what it's worth, we, you and I will we'll move on here, okay? Oh, I will. Sh- one thing I came across that I'll share with you is a epitaph that Robert Robertson put on the graves of his four infant children that died. He said, Born in fidelity, turn pale and die. Beneath this stone, four infants, ashes lie. Say, are they lost or saved? If death's by sin, they sin, for they lie here. If heaven's by works, in heaven they can't appear. Reason, ah, how depraved. Reverse the Bible's sacred page, the knot's untied. They died for Adam's sin, but they live for Jesus died. In our Job study, we're going to encounter an interesting surprise in, in, in the chapter 42. You all know the story how Job was one of the richest men in the area, had so many donkeys and camels and this and that and the other thing, and he had four sons and three daughters. Excuse me, seven sons and three daughters. And by because of the, part of his trial was he lost everything. He lost his sons and daughters. He lost all his his flocks and and so forth. And then in a second wave of of Satan's attack on Job, he loses his health. And of course, we most of the book is the dialogues between his so-called comforters. <laughs> And uh, so on. But at the end of the... And of course, God finally steps in and argues for Job in some, in some of the most fascinating chapters in the entire Bible. More on the creation in Job than there is in Genesis. But when you get to the last chapter, there's a few verses there. Most people miss the point. Because to reward Job, God doubled, gives him double everything he had before. We had 5,000 of these, you know, I was 10,000. Well, whatever, I forget the numbers. But each of the animals are listed just like they were before, but the numbers are twice. But then it lists that he also got, he had lost his sons and daughters. It says he's got seven sons and three daughters. And most people read that sort of puzzled. You know, you got twice the animals, twice as many pigs. You expect to have 14 sons and six daughters. His wife might not be that excited about it, but, um, the, uh, see what they miss is what the hidden thought behind that is that he didn't lose the first ones. They'll be there when he gets to heaven. And it's it's a very subtle but definitive encouragement, especially if you've lost children. Parents aren't supposed to outlive the children. That's a very special hurt. Anyway, let's get into uh, chapter 12. We still can make it because it's a short little chapter. 
verses 1. Uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses, there it is again, a quote, the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. Now, why is she unclean? Well, because she's brought a sinner into the world. Eve probably thought, when Cain was born, her firstborn son, that he was the Savior, had the promise. Chapter 3, verse 15. This is chapter 4. we got the Savior coming now. She like he was, I'm sure she probably thought he was, he was going to be the Savior. And uh, she, what she brought in the, world, in, the, in the world was the first murderer. Didn't know that when he was born. Cain was a sinner. I think he quits himself very well subsequently. All his children that are listed there in the genealogy. I always wonder, why is that genealogy there? All the kids have the name of God buried in them. So I think his children were taught the fear of God. I think this Levitical ritual that's dealing here was to remind the women that they are bringing to the world the same kind of baby that Eve brought into the world. They cannot do good. They can only sin. It's not particularly exciting to point that out to a young mother, but uh, we'll move on. See, Adam was a son of God. That term in the Hebrew, ben ha Elohim, son of God, is a term in the Old Testament of a direct creation of God. That's why it's always used of angels. Adam was the son of God. You and I are sons of Adam when we're born. And uh, the term son of God implies a direct creation of God, see? But you and I are sons of Adam. The only way we can become a son of God is by being born again. That's, what, that's why that term is not just a rhetorical device. It's a very, very specific uh, usage. In John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, Speaking of Jesus, He came unto His own, His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. Again, that idiom is being used very precisely. It is in chapter 3 of John that you really find out what born again really means and so on. Fine. Anyway, so this the young mother is going to have two periods of uncleanness. Seven and then 33 it will turn out. For the male child. For the male child, there's seven days of unclean. Then we have the eighth day, verse 3. On the In the eighth day... The flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. See, every male child was born a son of Adam. Even though he's born an Israelite, he's not included in the covenant until he is circumcised. So he can be an Israelite, but not in the covenant. Now, (laughs) it's interesting that modern medical science has discovered that a newborn baby has a peculiar susceptibility to bleeding between the second and fifth days of its life. Very susceptible to bleeding. Hemorrhages at this time can be critical and even produce serious damage to the internal organs, especially the brain, and cause death from shock and exosanguination, I think they call it. And uh, Now, there's an important blood clotting element called vitamin K. It's not found except in trivial amounts, until the fifth through the seventh day. But on the eighth day is the first safe day to perform a circumcision. Up till then, it's dangerous for a child to be circumcised. There's a second element that's also necessary for the normal clotting of blood, and that's called prothrombin. And uh, it is minimal in the first few days of the baby's life, but it skyrockets to 110% of normal on the eighth day of the baby's life. After that, it drops back to the normal, 100%, the normal level. So an eight-day-old baby is has more available prothrombin than any other day of its entire life. Now, the interesting question is, how did Moses know that? Trial and error? Think about it. <laughs> no, God told him in Genesis 17, verse 12, told Abraham that it's on the eighth day they are to be circumcised. See, earlier than that, very, very dangerous. That's the ideal day. And in fact, that day it's uniquely favored, if you will. Very interesting. Now those little charts and graph of prothrombin and, and vitamin K, I don't think were available to Moses. I don't think he did it by trial and error. That would be a very brutal way to find a procedure. <laughs> anyway, verse 4. Continuing with the mother here. She shall continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. 
For a male child, she'll have two periods of uncleanness, seven and then 33, a total of 40 days. She's simply being reminded that she's a sinner. She's a sinner. Now, there are some conjectures. Why these particularly 40 days? Well, it may be very reminiscent. See, there are some scholars that speculate, or there's a conjecture, that Adam and Eve remained only 40 days unfallen. That the incident with the tree of knowledge of good and evil occurred on the 40th day or 41st day or whatever of their, that there were only 40 days in paradise that were unfallen. And so, these 40 days may be reminiscent of the only 40 days of holiness on the earth where sin wasn't present. Now, it's interesting that the second Adam, Jesus Christ, was on the earth 40 days after his resurrection. And some scholars are fascinated by the symmetry of those two periods. And again, recalling to mind maybe the earth's time in paradise. See, and if so, then every 40th day period, which you encounter many places throughout the Scripture, may be reminiscent of paradise lost and so on. I... Interesting conjecture. Let's move on to verse 5. If she bear a male, a maid child, a female, in other words, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her separation, and she shall continue the blood of her purifying three score and six days. So the point is it's twice as long, doubling for a cleansing of the female child. Now this gets into all kinds of conjectures here. See, some suspect, well, the male had the benefit of being the covenant by the circumcision. That's one conjecture. Others to go to First Timothy two fourteen, reminding us that the woman was in the transgression. That again, this is is the whole idea that the woman is subject to the man and so forth because of First Timothy two about twelve. So you can just you can get, go through that. I think we're I should keep moving here to keep us time. You can check it out yourself. The girls won't like that passage, but it's there. Okay, you go from First Timothy two fourteen to Ephesians five, and that does not mean the man is superior to the woman. It just means that God has an order. In things, he has an order that he lays out. Verse six. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or a female. See, childbearing did not save her. Uh, commentators go sp- spend a lot of time on that. I haven't ever heard that view, but apparently some people feel that that some, has some kind of benefit. No, it doesn't, because she doesn't alter the fact that she's a sinner. And, and, and uh, the proof of that is the very fact that she, a burnt offering and a sin offering were required. Because she, Why? Because she's a sinner. Verse 8, And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles, two turtle doves, that is, or two young pigeons. The one for the burnt offering and the other for the sin offering. The priest shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. Now Mary, you may recall, in Luke chapter 2, followed this procedure. That shocks many people to think that through. That means Mary was a sinner, even though she gave birth to Jesus Christ. Jesus was sinless, that's an exception. That made she still was a sinner. She still brought, brought the, uh, the uh, doves and pigeons. See, his birth didn't save her. His death did. Uh, she uh, receives him. His death and resurrection is the key thing, and it's only by accepting Jesus that she was saved, not because she was the mother of the Lord. That's a tough spot for Catholics. because they, They've made a whole thing of Mary that's not scriptural. You might take a look at John's second epistle, Second John, as we call it. Brief little epistle. I believe it was written to Mary. If you study it very carefully, it's quite obvious that it was, in my opinion. She needed encouragement. She may have had a pride problem. She's very human. The Catholics have so deified her, and the Protestants have so reacted to, the, to their overreaction that there's a middle ground here where she's a, to be respected and, and honored, but she's a sinner, just like any of us, and had to be saved the same way any of us do. No offering was ever made for Jesus or uh, by Jesus, he was the only sinless one that's walked the earth. And it, it, not only did she provide this procedure, we also discover, of course, that they're very poor because they resorted to the special provision for people who were poor, that were in poverty. And uh, Isaiah's whisper comes to mind in Isaiah 55. It opens, it says, 
Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money. The door is open to the poorest. Because, and I think that's the reason he came in the poorest of circumstances. Many lessons there. Well, that concludes these two chapters. What I'd like you to do for next time, you might read the next three chapters, 13, 14, and 15. The three chapters are in leprosy. But there's far more to those three chapters than some hygiene having to do with this particular disease. There's far more going on there. We'll go through that. I encourage you to read through chapters 13, 14, 15 for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. Again and again and again, Father, we stand in awe as we begin to realize how you alone know the end from the beginning, how, how your word way back over 3,000 years ago anticipated those discoveries that have come to us in just recent years. We, we stand, Father, in just astonishment. We also stand in gratitude, Father, that you have loved us so much to go to such extremes that we might live. For we know we're not deserving, Father. We're sinners. We thank you, Father, for the ultimate sacrifice that you've engineered on our behalf, the very gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might have access to you, that we might have the benefit that you originally intended for mankind, to have fellowship with you. We thank you that you've gone to such extremes to repair the damage that we've all done. Oh, Father, we just do pray that you would make us sensitive, ever more sensitive to your holiness, that you would help us moment by moment, day by day, make those decisions that will honor you, that will reflect your holiness and our commitment to you, Father. We know they'll be imperfect, and yet, Father, we do seek you, Father. We seek your face. We seek to be called by your name. We seek to be separate in our own way, Father. We do pray, Father, you would just help us to be more responsive to what you would have of each of us in every detail. Because we realize you are a God of the details, Father. We thank you, Father, that the word approximate is not in your vocabulary, Father. That you mean what you say and say what you mean. Help us, Father, to understand that. Help us, Father, to follow that. As we do this night, without any reservation, commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.